It's the beginning of September and we're looking at the Brussels sprouts here. Brussels sprouts are still a little bit young, although some of the earlier varieties are beginning to produce some nice sprouts. What we're really trying to do is we're trying to time this crop for harvest right around the Thanksgiving period, maybe a little bit before Thanksgiving and past Thanksgiving and into Christmas. And it's really a little bit too early to talk too much about different varieties, but let's, while we have you on the line, talk a little bit about how to manage a Brussels sprout crop. Ideally, Brussels sprouts grow without stress, so that means relatively cool temperatures, regular rain, not too much, not too little, no heat, and nice, even growing. Well, there's very few places in the United States where that can happen, although, you know, you can think about uh, the Pacific Northwest, Vancouver, maybe some of the more maritime regions of uh, uh, northeastern Canada. Those areas are fairly well suited to growing Brussels sprout. The rest of us have to do the best we can. Well, the best that you can do is to make sure that Brussels sprouts at least are irrigated so you don't have the drought stress during the summertime. And then the next thing to do is to make sure that you have enough fertility in the beginning of the season to make sure that the Brussels sprouts grow nice and tall. The taller they grow before stress comes, the, the better chance you have of nice even sprout production. The next thing to remember is enough fertility, but not too much. Ideally, the plants run out of fertility towards the end of the season. And you can see this as we pan down towards the floor of this production over here, we see a lot of yellow leaves. And what you can see is that as these leaves fall off, what the plant actually does, it steals the nutrients out of these lower leaves and invests them in the Brussels sprouts themselves. And then as the Brussels sprouts continue to grow, more and more of these yellow leaves fall off. Sometimes you're conditioned to say, oh, the leaves are turning yellow, I need to give them more nitrogen. That's actually the wrong thing to do with Brussels sprouts. Ideally, at Thanksgiving, there'll be just a few leaves here at the top of the plant. There'll be nice sprouts up and down the stem and all the leaves are yellow and dead and have fallen off. So you have nothing but a naked stem of some really nice Brussels sprouts. Another thing I want to point out to you is that timing with Brussels sprouts is always a little bit tricky. If you planted the Brussels sprouts too early, that means that the bottom sprouts overdevelop and they often begin to tear themselves apart a little bit. Some of the tissues break off, they get invaded by things like alternaria, and then you end up with some pretty yucky looking sprouts, or the technical botanical term for that is funky. So if the lower sprouts are getting too funky for you at harvest time, maybe you planted them a little bit too soon. Uh, we're gonna show you some images of planting of a planting experiment that we did back in 2018 where we planted Brussels sprouts in the middle of May, we planted them in the middle of June, and we planted them in the middle of July, and we evaluated their performance in the middle of October, just a couple of weeks before Thanksgiving. And what you will see is that in the planting in May, a lot of the bottom sprouts are really, they've got that uh, funkiness going on, even though there's lots of sprouts all up and down the stem. The next image shows a plant that was planted in the middle of June, and you can see that there is some funkiness going on at the very bottom of the stem, but there's plenty of sprouts all up and down the stem, and even the top sprouts are beginning to fill out pretty nice. So maybe not all the sprouts are harvestable, but I would say 80 to 85% of them are. And then the last image is a plant that was planted in the middle of July, and you can see that there is no decay on those sprouts, but what you do see is that the top sprouts haven't filled out, so there's really not that much yield in a late planting. So the trick is finding the balance between early planting, late planting, having good quality sprouts at the time that you want to harvest them. If you want to harvest earlier, then you should plant a little bit earlier. If you want to harvest a little bit later, you probably have to plant a little bit later, or you have to work with varieties that mature later. Let's take a look at some varieties. The first variety that I'd like to show you is Sylvia. Relatively new, but we're really impressed with the nice earliness on this variety and the fact that it makes a really nice medium sprout without getting oversized. You can see some over here. Early, nice dense sprout, smooth. And what you're going to see later on at harvest time is that most of the sprouts are going to have this size, maybe just a little bit larger, but it's a nice tall stem 
and it'll be a nice even distribution of these kinds of sprouts all up and down the stem. Interesting, early and still pretty good field holding. This one will make it to Thanksgiving, but if you wanted to take it earlier, you could. Here's an interesting variety that I just want to point out to you, just to see the difference between older breeding and newer breeding. If you take a look at this variety, Franklin, nice sprout, nice flavor, nothing wrong with this, but you see all these leaves on this sprout plant, the long petioles, and you can see that there is very little walk, room to walk down the middle of the row, as opposed to some of the other varieties that we'll show you in just a little bit. But with all this mass, what happens is that these plants can get a little top heavy and because the stem is not strong enough, the stem will fall over and then will right itself again. So quite often what you see with these older varieties that they will have a bit of a gooseneck to them. So one of them will fall to the right, the other one fall to the left and then they fall over each other and it'll be a nice jungle as you try to get in here and pick some Brussels sprouts. Something to keep in mind when we take a look at the other varieties. You can see what I meant about big leaves versus small leaves. We're here in this variety called Dagen. Very nice variety, works very well for a lot of people. It's a relatively early, makes nice large medium sprouts, but you can see the leaves are small, the petioles are short. There's plenty of room in between these rows if you wanted to get in, if you had to do some work, if you had to do some spraying, if you had to do a little bit of side dressing with fertilizer, you can still get in. And especially if you wanted to do something with mechanical harvesting, of course, it's very nice because all the plants are in a nice tight row. The other thing about these compact plants is that you can always put them a little bit closer together that forces them to stretch a little bit more, more. You get a bit a little bit longer stem, but you also get more plants per acre. That means more revenue for you. Now I'm in the variety Marte. You can see it's a little bit more vigorous than Dagen. It's a very strong grower. And my Lord, it makes really nice sprouts. And it makes a lot of them. Medium to medium large sprouts, similar as Dagen. A little bit better quality. And Marte is a little bit easier to grow yet than Dagen. This is really our favorite. Now I am in our variety Nautic. We sell Nautic only as organic seed. Nautic is a little bit later maturing. It makes beautiful sprouts. It runs out of fertility quite easily. It's maybe not quite as vigorous as Marte, but it is also a very reliable sprout, especially for late season production. Nautic is a really easy growing variety. It sheds the sprouts very easily. It has nice sprout quality. You can pick them by hand or if you'd like, you sell them on the stock. Brussels sprouts is not the easiest crop to grow. We all know that. Most of you have tried it and with varying degrees of success. Let's review. Fertility, a lot of fertility in the beginning of the season, but you have to run out towards the end of the season. Timing, don't plant too early don't plant too late and then lastly select the varieties that work best for you that means you're probably going to have to experiment a little bit with fertility you're going to have to experiment a little bit with timing and you're going to have to try some of these varieties and find out which is best for your market for your circumstances and for your season but if you have any questions don't hesitate to ask we're here to help Doubling is when a single onion produces two bolts. This onion is a double and it was, it was from the same root base. But you see we have two onions which have a very odd shape and therefore are not marketable. This is a negative uh, because we want to produce a maximum number of onions as possible. We can avoid this by, first of all, genetics. Uh, we strive to breed varieties that are resistant to doubling. We, we always screen for this in our trials and if we make a note that a, a potential variety has tendencies to double, that's a major negative for that variety. Secondly, it's environmental conditions. Certain environmental conditions can increase uh, doubling in some varieties. This is our variety Allison. Allison was our first major introduction into the Vidalia market and is a variety which I am very proud of. Allison is a variety with excellent yield potential 
and it also fills the later season harvest segment. It is still growing in popularity to this day in Vidalia and also other short day growing regions. This is BGS 369. It is currently our newest introduction of varieties. This variety has many positive characteristics which I'm very excited about, including the attractive bulbs and upright tops and also the petite necks. This variety has a lot of potential for the Vidalia area and also other short day growing areas. One thing I would like to mention about the petite necks is the fact that it will allow for, for faster drying time at harvest and also the upright tops allow for the prevention of pathogens and disease from entering down into the bulb. This is our variety making. The main thing that I would like to say about making is the fact that it's our later season harvest variety. This variety was bred in order to have an option for the later season harvest. The benefit of that is the fact that it allows growers to harvest onions from the beginning of season to the end of season as this variety will mature in the late season harvest. This variety allows you to have a harvest of onions in early May, which is the later season harvest segment. This variety is also very productive and has high yield potential. One common question that many onion growers have and are always looking for the answer to is when do I harvest my onions? When do I harvest this variety? Now we're looking at a, at a plot of onions that is mature right now. The, the most common indicator of maturity is the beginnings of a soft neck. These onions, as they reach maturity, the, the neck begins to soften and become supple and even begin to fall over. That is the main indicator of maturity. Uh, one common rule of thumb when it comes to uh, harvesting onions in the southern regions of the USA, especially in the southeast, is that it's better to be a day early than a day late. In the, in the challenging conditions we have here, um, the longer the onions stay in the ground, the more potential problems can arise. So when the necks begin to become soft and the bulbs have the proper size, to pull them out of the ground and let them begin the drying process. Here we have growing in front of us our leading variety in the Vidalia area, Pirate. Pirate is a classic Vidalia type variety. It has many of the features that Vidalia type varieties are known for, such as flatter granite shape, lighter colored skins, and sweet mild flavor. Pirate is an onion that is widely adapted across all short day growing regions. Pirate works anywhere in the southern USA. This is our variety Tania. It's a newer introduction from Bijo. It's one that I've been excited about from the past several years of trials. It has sweet flavor, a good shape, lighter color skins, and nice roots. Tania has a slightly, slightly deeper shape which has additional yield potential. This is a Bijo breeding's answer to the industry's request for an onion that carries a little more weight through the body, a little more well filled out onion, which can help provide additional yield potential. We have a lot of onions here at Bijo, and you are familiar with a lot of the yellow varieties. You're also familiar with a lot of the red varieties, and we've talked about this in previous segments, and you're certainly welcome to give us a call and learn more about them or go to our website. But let's talk a little bit about white onions. White onions are not nearly so easy to grow here in the Northeast, and the reason for that is, is that the skin of yellow onions and the skin of red onions contain phenolic compounds that are antibacterial and antifungal, and it helps these onions survive the difficult periods in wintertime that they need to survive to, in order to make seed the next year. White onions are much more commonly produced in dry desert areas. There the skin doesn't have to have those kinds of uh, resistances to fungal diseases, but if we grow them in a moist area here in the northeast, then some of those fungi can attack these white skins and make them rather weathered looking. You can see it here, for instance, on these, some of these onions in here. We can see some orangey red color showing up. This is a disease called pink root that can move into the skin. But we can also see some weathering over here that is caused by a fungus called smudge, or we call it tautricum. In order to get halfway decent white onions here in the northeast, it's best to take them out of the field before they're completely mature 
and let them finish off in an area where there's good ventilation, no moisture. And then the second thing that we do is here, over here we have under the shade of these trees or you can put them in a barn where it's nice and dark. Light penetrates these white skins very easily and then the underlying tissues are exposed to light and that stimulates the formation of chlorophyll which turns the onions green. Something we want to avoid. The next thing is select varieties that have good strong white skin, multi, multiple layers of skin that help you clean the onions up a little bit even after they've gotten a little smudgy. First variety that we have here is white wing. Pretty good, but it's an intermediate onion. It is not one for long-term storage. Skin is decent, but we have better. This one is ice pearl, uh, later maturing, intermediate onion. And then we have some long day onions, uh, right? This type over here is bright white. If I had to choose for early production, I would use white wing, get it out of the field quick and sell it quick or if you wanted to store them bright white. You can see nice white onion and once this onion dries up I can peel this outer skin off and I have a pretty nice white onion even in the humid northeast. Think about it. If you've seen this AAS winner label, perhaps in a seed catalog or on a retail plant, you might wonder what it means. Well, All America Selections is a nonprofit organization founded in 1932, and it consists of a group of horticultural professionals that trial throughout the US and Canada. And they'll take breeders new varieties in blind trials and select for best garden performance for national and regional award winners. And so Bejo, as a trial ground and also a participating breeder, have many varieties that have won throughout the years. As a breeding company, we do not trial our own varieties because of course, then it wouldn't be a blind trial anymore. But instead, in the other dozens of trial grounds around the US, most of these varieties have found to be national award winners for their um, excellent garden merit. And so if you're a consumer looking to buy a variety that you can trust to have adaptability to your area, or if you're a breeding company that's looking for a little extra oomph in your media and marketing promotion plans, then go to allamericaselections.org and explore your options today. If you know Bejo, then you know that we have a long history of breeding and producing for organic seed varieties. If you're new to Bejo, then perhaps you check out our YouTube videos or Bejo.com for a list of almost 120 varieties organically available to you. That's breeding for organic, but Bejo also breeds with organic. And what that means is we work with our dealers and our growers to really listen to what the trends and needs are of the organic community. And so whether that's keeping our ear to the ground on upcoming legislation like excluded methods in breeding or greater need for on-farm trialing, we listen to all of that. And here I have three examples of how we've listened to the community to bring organic seed products to you. So this here is our early Primero cabbage. It's an early red variety. And so many of the cabbage and brassicas are going towards CMS. And so this is a standard hybrid red that is now available as organic seed. Here we have darky boar kale. And so some of the F1 kale varieties were very difficult in seed production. And we found that darky boar could consistently allow for organic seed to be available to organic growers. And so darky boar organic kale is now available to you. And then finally, innovator shallot. This is a downy mildew resistant shallot. And as you know, of course, disease resistance is so important in organic growing. And so now we have conserver shallot available as organic seed to you, the grower and dealer of organic varieties. 
So you bring the information to Bejo and we'll bring our expertise to you and together we'll continue to supply and produce organic seed for the organic community. Bijou has been breeding tomatoes for about 20 years, maybe a little bit longer. Our first introductions uh, focused on the uh, late blight resistance. So it's, you may know some of those varieties that we've introduced, things like uh, Mountain Magic, Plum Regal, uh, Mountain Rouge is another nice example. And we'll show you a few others here in just a minute. Then our focus shifted a little bit more towards uh, color and flavor. And then now presently we are working on tomatoes for the Southeast that have really good resistance to a lot of the diseases that growers uh, have to deal with, such as tomato yellow leaf curl virus, spotted wilt virus, and now also Fusarium 3. But let's go back to the late bite resistant varieties and take a look at the first one that I want to show you here, which is a huge success in the Northeast. This is Mountain Gem. Late blight resistant, and you can see it has a really nice, healthy, strong vine. It is relatively compact, so you don't need a lot of staking. Of course, you stake them, but you don't need the really tall stakes. And it's got really nice, large fruit, which is ideal for the New England market. Good cover, plenty of fruit set, and nice, extra large fruit. Very nice, clean blossom end, no cracking. Let's cut one open and see what they look like inside. Nice color. And you'll have to believe me, flavor is very good. Here's another late blight resistant variety that we have recently introduced. This variety is called Carol. It's a compact indeterminate plant so you can see it's quite a bit larger than mountain gem but that means it is not a, not so much of a concentrated set but more of an extended pick so if you're looking for something interesting in a in a high tunnel for instance this would be a very interesting choice but also if you have a smaller tomato production but you want to continue to pick uh, fruit uh, this would be a really good variety for that the late light blight resistance gives this plant a very nice healthy vine with excellent cover very good fruit set from bottom to top and as we get into here a little bit closer I'll show you some nice fruit. Nice clean blossom end. Very firm fruit. This fruit is firm enough that it'll last for two weeks without getting soft. So excellent opportunities for long-term marketing. and a nice color. We just looked at Carol, which is a late bite resistant variety, and it uh, has a very nice, strong vine. This is a little bit more compact vine. This is Cheryl. Cheryl is not late bite resistant, but it does have spotted wilt resistance, TY resistance, and it has nice flavor uh, together with the crimson gene, so very nice color. Cheryl makes medium to large fruit, so uh, a little bit smaller than what the, the tomatoes that we looked at earlier, but super good quality and very nice flavor. Let's see if we can find one. There's plenty to choose from here, so no worries. Nice red fruit, excellent quality, and beautiful internal color. Wow. The next two varieties I'd like to show you are Loretta and Jolene. Loretta and Jolene were developed for the tomato growers in Florida because they both have crown rot resistance, which can be quite a problem in Florida. They also both have the crimson gene, so that nice red interior and the fruit. Loretta is resistant to spotted wilt virus. Jolene is resistant to the TY virus. So whatever your problem is, we have a solution. Look at this nice vine that we have over here. The plant has really nice cover. It really covers the fruit. There's plenty of fruit all the way from the bottom to the top. And you can see we're here in New York. These varieties work well, very well in the Northeast as well. The fruit 
We have nice fruit on it, nice large fruit, good firmness, beautiful color, and a nice red interior. And so here we are with Loretta, a related to Jolene, very similar type. Again, beautiful fruit cover. This one has the resistance to the TY virus, together with the crown rot and the crimson gene. And in, this, and in addition to that, very good heat setting ability. Yes, that's important for hot climates, which includes the Northeast. Remember how we had some really hot periods early in the spring? So having good fruit set from bottom to top is one of the trademarks of Loretta. Let's take a look at the fruit. Again, that nice red color. Very good. Here's a variety that you really should try in the Northeast. This, is, this variety is called Kerry. Kerry's got beautiful strong vine, really nice cover on the fruit. It sets really heavy and it sets early and you have a very nice early crop of tomatoes with excellent flavor. Very good. So you picked up on the theme already, I think, at this point, uh, all of our latest tomato introductions are named after country music artists. We are here with a variety that works really well in the Northeast, but it works everywhere else as well. She is very popular. Her name is Patsy. Patsy's got beautiful cover, very good heat set, lots of fruit. She's resistant to spotted wilt, TY. She's got the crimson gene. She's got extra large fruit that is nice and firm. What more could you want? Look at these tomatoes. Beautiful, good flavor. It works everywhere. That's just crazy. Well, Chelsea, thanks very much for coming all the way up from Pennsylvania to join us for this demonstration and to help explain some of the things that work well in the Bijou assortment. I think you probably have had enough conversations with your customers where you heard some laments about the demise of Nelson. What happened to Nelson? What are, you, what are your customers telling you? I've heard that a time or two. They really miss out on the great properties that Nelson brought to the table, but I hear that we have some new things coming that they'll be quite happy with. I think they'll be very pleased with it. We have a new variety in the mid-early Nance category. This is a variety called Narvik. Narvik has, just like you said, Chelsea, all the same properties of Nelson, but stronger top. Nice crunchy texture, good yielding ability, smooth roots, excellent flavor. The next introduction that is coming along is Nagasaki. Nagasaki is still quite new, so we're just trying to get some experience with this variety. Uh, Narvik is already available as commercial seed, so you know your customers are going to be able to place some orders for it. Yep, we'll see it this spring. Yep, and then this Nagasaki is one uh, that we uh, noticed has a very, very nice flavor coming out of storage. Mm. Maybe not the best flavor right out of the field, but like some other carrots in storage, they sweetened up very, very nicely, super high quality. That's great, so one for each side of the season. Yep. Coming straight out of the field and then out of storage. You two got it. Two options. Great. Now, for our viewers, let's make sure that they taste okay. Let's taste some Narvik. Thank you. Ah, yeah. Lovely. I think I can get the kids to eat this with some snacks in their lunchbox. Really nice. Sweet, crunchy, beautiful structure, texture. It's a hit. We get a lot of questions at Bejo about colored carrot mixes. And so you know about our naturally occurring rainbow mix, but did you know that we also have other colors that you can mix at home or in your shop and come up with your own beautiful, vibrant packages? So purple haze is probably our best known purple carrot, vibrant purple outside, beautiful orange core, but it can be difficult to meet uh, seed demand. 
So we have two other purples that you can substitute for purple haze. Deep purple, which is purple all the way through and time similarly to purple haze at about 75 days to maturity. If you're further south, you'll wanna look at purple sun, which is 85 days to maturity and works in a longer um, growing climate. Then we have white satin, really nice clear white root and delicious, creamy, mild eating quality. Our two new colored varieties, yellow moon and red sun. Yellow moon has less green shoulders and a really nice smooth clear root and um, better tolerance to bolting. Similarly, Red Sun has better tolerance to bolting and a nice mild flavor, unlike some of the uh, astringent reds that you'll have known in the past. And all of these varieties, Red Sun, Yellow Moon, White Satin, and Deep Purple, time out at about 70, 75 days to maturity, which goes really well with Naval and helps create a beautiful mix similar to our sunset mix or any of these other ones that we've tried. So if you wanna pre-mix the seed um, in your own shed or sow them out individually and pull bunches and mix together for market, we have options for you with Bejo colored carrots. For over 30 years, Bejo Italia out of Rimini, Italy, has been focusing on hybrid radicchio and treviso for the trade. As you can see, these hybrids are uniform, beautiful emergence, even color and uniform harvest. And now Bejo USA gets to take all of that wonderful hybrid work and bring it to the US to work with our partners to have the best varieties available for growers. Here we have our Leonardo radicchio, which is this beautiful red, very smooth head that works well for late summer production here in the Northeast. And here a new variety, Caravaggio, which will be also similarly beautiful red, nice tight heads later into the fall season, will be coming to you new from Bejo in spring 2022. Bijo has a presence all over the world and one of the places where we're quite strong is in Italy. We have a very good and very long-standing fennel breeding program in Italy and our Italian colleagues are making some super fennel. Trouble with fennel sometimes is, is that it bolts and I'm sure some of you have tried fennel will, uh, will recognize this. Uh, the fennel makes a flower prematurely and what that then means is that the bulb itself is rather skinny and the scales get rather fibrous. It helps a lot if you plant fennel after the longest day because as the days are lengthening, that helps to trigger uh, the, the bolting. You also have to be careful about which varieties you use. Some varieties are much more sensitive to bolting than others. The Zefa phenotypes, for instance, are really not adapted to this area because our day lengths are relatively intermediate length, whereas the Zefa phenotypes are much more adapted to the long day types. Here's a variety that bolted, and here's a variety that didn't bolt. Look at that, planted at the same time. See how nice and fleshy this bulb is? See how wide it is? It's got hips, and it's got some oomph to it. This variety is the best variety that you could choose for fennel production here in the Northeast. Its name is Dragon. We have beautiful fennel. It's very reliable. You too could be Italian if you can grow fennel like this in your own yard. We've talked to you about cilantro before, but just had to bring it up again. Look at this beautiful variety commander here in Geneva in September. This variety is bolt tolerant, Super uniform, wonderful flavor, great scent, and worth giving a try on your farm today. Mm. 
Look at this beautiful asparagus. Clean fronds, all spear production down here. No berries, no volunteers. And do you know why that is? All Bejo asparagus is male sterile. This means no female berries later in the season, no little runty volunteer showing up that you have to cull in the fall. And all of this production goes right back into the spears for an increased yield every season. Not to mention the seed has better vigor and germination than older OP varieties. And these plots can easily last in the field 10 to 12 years. So if you're thinking of a new asparagus plot over the next decade, look for Bejo male sterile asparagus. Here we are in one of Bijo's core crops, cabbage. You know, Bijo is synonymous with cabbage. And we have lots of different types. We're gonna talk a little bit in this segment about fresh market cabbage. The variety that we have over here, Faro, you know very well. It's the first early cabbage that has enough productivity. It's not yellow's resistance, but we have organic seed of it and it works really well. Multiple plantings during the season, not too big, nice cabbage. Sometimes people for fresh market cabbage want a little bit more productivity. And here we have a variety that is super productive. This variety is called Conqueror. It does have yellow resistance. It is very productive. It is early. It is actually earlier than the variety that stands behind me, Artoast. Let's take a look at a nice head of Conqueror here. Nice clean cabbage, excellent field holding, and even though this cabbage is quite mature, do you see any thrips on here? I don't, very nice. That's productive, very nice. So we'll step over this variety over here, Artoast, that most of you already know. It's a nice, early, productive cabbage but it's not as early as Conqueror. So Conqueror is really a step up in our assortment. Now we're getting into these varieties over here, and I'm really excited to show you these varieties because these are super healthy and very clean varieties. Bellicose is the first one with very good resistance to black rot. The next one is Botran, also with super good resistance to black rot. And so a real step up for growers of cabbage in the Northeast. You can see that these varieties have a very healthy frame, very nice upstanding foliage, not as open and naked as these varieties are over here. And at the same time, nice cabbage. We're gonna get into a little bit more detail on bellicose here in a little while, but it works great as a small boxing cabbage. Plenty of density, nice clean cabbage. What's not to like? With black resistance. And then you see this one over here. Botran, perfectly fine for a boxing cabbage. See, nice frame on it, good wrap. But as an individual head, nice and clean, no thrips. Dense, healthy, and delicious. I'd like to show you a little bit what bellicose can do. It, bellicose is quite a, an adaptable variety and works at many different spacings. Here we have a, a, a nice tight spacing and we make beautiful boxing cabbage or RPC cabbage out of this variety. It's got plenty of leaf. As you can see, nicely wrapped cabbage and clean. And if you take a look at this uniformity in here, every single head 
is about the same size. So your uniformity of harvest and your recovery is close to 100%. It's been a bit of a wet summer here in Geneva. And what we're beginning to see now is some varieties are really beginning to break down with some diseases, like what we see here. Look at this, and this head, and this head, and this head, and this head, and that one, and that one. There's not too much good cabbage in here, a lot of rot. Unfortunately, this is a variety from a competition. This is Cheers, usually a quite good cabbage in the southeast, but at the same time, it's really interesting to see this Cheers next to this Bellicose. Here we have Bellicose at a little bit wider spacing. And with the wider spacing, we get bigger heads. This is probably an eight pounder, maybe a nine pounder. Look at that density in it. Look at that beautiful structure. And look at this healthy crop, bellicose. Now we are in a last planting of bellicose. And we planted this cabbage to basically see what the varieties can do, how productive can they be. And if you look around you a little bit, you see a lot of large heads. This is for early processing cabbage. Bellicose fits really well into this category as well. Very nice healthy plants, as I already explained, super good black rot resistance and an enormous yield potential. Big plants, big heads, Clean, healthy, plenty of weight, gorgeous cabbage. So what you see really is bellicose can work in three different ways. It could be a small boxing cabbage for fresh market for RPCs. It could be a little bit larger in the Danish class, so to speak, boxing cabbage, shipping cabbage. It can also be an early maturing processing cabbage. So very versatile very adaptable, very healthy. You have probably heard at one point or another talk about Danish cabbage and sometimes you get the question, what is Danish cabbage? Well, Danish cabbage, as I've talked to my colleagues in Denmark, they explained it to me very well. They said, dat er dansk kolen ook dansk kwaliteit. Danish cabbage, Danish quality. So think IKEA, think Volvo, think all the things that you would like to think about when you're thinking about the Scandinavians. Understated, but super high quality. What makes Danish cabbage Danish? Well, it was originally developed in Denmark for shipping. So they shipped it to England, they shipped it to Russia, they shipped it to Scandinavia, they shipped it all over the place. And that means that you have to have a little bit harder cabbage than we have in the fresh market cabbage, like the Faro and the Conqueror types. Those are very early, but they're also a little softer and not quite as suitable for long distance shipping. But these cabbages come on relatively early in summer, are hard enough that they don't bruise very easily, so you can pack them together in a box, boxing cabbage therefore, and they can be shipped long distance, and they're very productive, very dense, so for the volume of shipping that you ship, you are also shipping a lot of weight. And that's exactly what we like about these cabbages. With spacing, you can keep them small enough that they work really, really well in RPCs. And the other nice thing about them is that they make very nice coleslaw that is not soggy, but crisp and crunchy. Nice, dense cabbage. Hard. Crisp, crunchy. So you make coleslaw out of this, you can keep it in the fridge for a whole week. It doesn't get soggy. We have multiple varieties in this Danish segment, and I'm going to highlight four of these varieties for you today. The first one that I want to show you is Bayonet. Bayonet is earliest in this segment to mature, a little bit earlier than Bronco that we'll see next. But it is a very nice, productive, clean cabbage that will work well at a little bit wider spacing even to give you a nice productive cabbage early. The second variety in this Danish segment is one that 
all of you know already, it's Bronco. It's been around for quite some time and it's very difficult to get a cabbage that is better than this. It is reliable, it is productive, it is healthy, and it will give you a crop every single time. It's got decent resistance to black rot, although it's not the strongest, but good enough for most purposes. Bronco. The third variety, very closely related to Bronco, is this variety over here, Ramada. Ramada works really well in the southeastern states, but it's also not bad here in the northeast. It's clean, it is healthy, it can tolerate some of the colder temperatures and still produce a very, very nice and productive cabbage. Ramada. And now the last one in this little segment on Danish cabbage is Botran. Nice leafy frame, very healthy cabbage, really good resistance to black rot. And as you can see here, it's quite early. It's probably a little earlier than Bronco. It has all the productivity of Bronco and all the black rot resistance that you'll ever need. Botran. We just talked about green Danish cabbage, but there are also red versions of Danish cabbage. And one of them that is very popular and that most of you know very well is Cairo. Cairo is a nice red cabbage. It's productive. It's got good red color. And works just about anywhere. Nice, huh? Chelsea, will you hold this one for me? Happy to. This is our newest introduction into this Cairo segment, the early red Danish cabbages. It's called Cantaro. Cantaro is male sterile, so it means that we have very good seed production of this variety and also in the field very high uniformity, which is quite nice for you as a grower. Let's take a look at what Cantaro looks like. You can see a little bit more red color than Cairo, quite intensely colored. Nice structure, nice color. Cairo, Cantaro.